In May 2005, nine-year-old Crystal Tobias and her eight-year-old friend Laura Hobbs went to play at their local park on their bikes. They didn't return. They found them by the park, and um, I remember that day my heart fell on the floor. When that happened, my whole life felt like I was living in darkness. No matter how bright it was outside, it was very dark. Suspicion immediately turned to the father of one of the girls who'd recently been released from prison. He had found his daughter brutalized, killed, stabbed, and yet he's the only likely suspect, and in the end, is indeed convicted. The grieving father spent five years behind bars before DNA uncovered the true killer who'd been hiding in plain sight all along. A family friend, Jorge Torres. I didn't know what to think at that time. This was somebody that was coming back and hanging out with me after my sister was dead, and he was the one to do it. The double murder was just the beginning. Five years later, a DNA trail would reveal Jorge Torres as one of the world's most evil killers. February 2010, 21-year-old U.S. Marine Jorge Torres was arrested for abduction, use of firearms, and rape. Theo Stamos was a lead prosecutor on the case. He didn't look menacing. He didn't look like someone who is your stereotypical serial murderer slash rapist. That's actually what made it even more sinister, because he was so unassuming that way. After a series of targeted attacks on women in Arlington, Virginia, Torres had been tracked down by police. These were just dedicated police officers on patrol in a suburb of Washington, D.C., who put together their observations, their surveillance, their police work, and helped to arrest a very, very dangerous guy. After his arrest, the subsequent investigation revealed Torres was responsible for a lot more than anyone had expected. When we learned that he had been involved as a, I believe, a 16-year-old murdering these two young, innocent girls, it was mind-blowing. This killer's story began in Zion, Illinois, where Jorge Avila Torres was born in 1988. His father was a working class guy, mother as well. So from what I could tell, he came from a pretty solid family. I don't think you could call him exactly a gregarious boy, rather sort of remote. I think he struggled somewhat at school and consoled himself by cycling around the area. He was a keen cyclist. It was whilst out cycling in the local neighborhood that Torres met Alberto Segura, and the pair became friends. He was a really quiet guy. He didn't speak very much. He was a little older than I was, but he kept to himself. And somewhat like my sister, we were very nice. And if we see somebody by themselves, we will be like, hey, come here. What, what you doing? You want to come play with us? And that's kind of how it all happened. As Alberto got to know the 16-year-old, he noticed Torres, known as George by his friends, spent little time with his family. He really did not like being at home. He didn't ever give me much details, but he wouldn't really talk really good about his parents. He would always say, oh, I can't wait to leave my house. Yeah, I can't wait to finally, you know, get my own spot. Very often when we look at individuals like Torres, they feel excluded. But when you speak to the members of their family, it's very clear that that wasn't the case, but it's that perception of exclusion that matters here. When the two teens started to take an interest in girls, this feeling of exclusion would be exacerbated 
as an awkward Torres struggle to connect with the opposite sex. I remember examples of when like George would be like, well, dude, how do you get girls, man? Like, it seems like girls just want to date you all the time. There's quite clear evidence that Torres was very jealous of Alberto, who seemed to be able to meet girls at any instant and befriend them. So when I was dating this gal named Jenny, there will be a time where he'll come with me. And he would always have an expression on his face, like, what am I doing wrong? Like, how did he get her? And what's wrong with me type of look. So here we have this tension that's developing. He feels an entitlement to be dating, but the women he wants to date don't want to date him. So they become almost like an enemy that he has to defeat. All the girls would be like, no, uh-uh, get away from me. And I'm just like, I don't know why they're doing that to you, George, but you're coming off weird. I would notice that, you know what, maybe there's something wrong here with just how he's talking to, to women. It wasn't just how Torres was talking to women that gave Alberto calls for concern. There's an example where he tied a girl to a trampoline, like being funny, but that ain't funny. They were jumping around, just having a good old time. Then the girls are like versus the boys and the boys versus the girls type of situation. And then he took it too far and then grabbed like a jump rope and tied her to the, to the pole of the trampoline and kind of was like, now you're stuck. What are you going to do? This is a really concerning story in his background because it shows that he wants to dominate women. He wants to humiliate women. Little by little is where I would be like, you know what, maybe I need to keep a distance. And so, and I did. The friends saw less and less of each other until Mother's Day 2005. That fateful day began like any usual Sunday for Alberto. I was walking home, and it had to be like 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. I see my sister riding her bike to Laura's house, and she was on the sidewalk, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to Laura's house. Nine-year-old Laura Hobbs had become best friends with Alberta's little sister, Crystal, soon after her family moved into the neighborhood. Their relationship was really close. They would do everything together. I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything. And they would have sleepovers. They both liked the same things. They, they both liked planting. And so it, they had a connection. They both liked riding their bikes together. Whatever they can do together, they would. The girls would usually be out on their bikes until dinner time. But on this particular day, they didn't return. The sun was starting to go down a little bit. It was around maybe six, seven o'clock, and usually Laura's home at a much earlier time. Alberto and Crystal's mum, Marina, was at home preparing a family meal. It's when I was gonna start dinner, Laura's mom came to, to my house to ask if Laura was there. I said, no. And so her mom was already kind of freaking out. I didn't think nothing of it. I'm like, well, go, let's go ask Crystal. Let's see where she's at. Like, you know, let's, let's ask her if, if she knows where Laura's at. And then I realized, like, well, she ain't here. Crystal is not here. But I didn't thought right away nothing bad. We started looking, and that's when we didn't find her and asking the neighbors. And that's when we got nervous and anxious. Laura's mom and my mom decide, well, let's call the cops, you know, because they're never out past this time. There's, they're always somewhere where they can be seen. A few friends of mine, we got on our bikes and we started going around the whole neighborhood trying to find her. The entire community of Zion rallied together, and as police arrived to join the search, fears started to mount for the girl's safety. I remember a police officer, once I pulled up to the front of the house, I'm like, whoa, this is serious. It's like, my sister is 
missing at the moment, and it was then it was becoming more scary. I was feeling really bad because not knowing where she was or with who, and uh, or who would have taken her or something. I was thinking the the worst actually. Everyone was looking for her. There was at least 20, 25 people out walking around in different directions and different pockets uh, of people looking around. One of the people who takes part in that initial search is Jorge Torres. I remember him riding his bike around. He wasn't in my group, but I remember him riding his bike. With no sign after hours of searching, Alberto and Marina returned home to wait for news. Police and family continued to search. As night falls, the search for Crystal and Laura is called off. But Jerry Hobbs and Laura's grandfather, Art, keep on searching through the night. I was just hoping to find her. I just wanted her to come back. We even shot me and my husband and my, my kids. We would never thought that something so bad could happen. It would be an agonizing night for the families of the young girls, and the following morning, their worst fears were confirmed. Desperate for news, Crystal's mother, Marina, went to the Hobbs house the following morning. I went to hers, and that's when she said, you don't know yet. I said, what? I said that they found them in the park. On the 9th of May, at 6 a.m., the two young girls were discovered in the woods of Beulah Park in Zion. Laura had been sexually assaulted, and both girls had been brutally murdered. They found out first. I think it was like um, her husband and uh, his father found them in the woods. Yeah. After that, well, yeah, I knew that there was no more hope and now. Uh, that there was no, uh, there was no way she was coming back. My mom tells my dad that my sister was found and that she was dead. My dad ran upstairs. He was crying. It was the first time I've ever seen him cry. My brothers woke up. They heard everything and they were sobbing. They were crying loud. Uh, my youngest brother, David, he, he, that was his best friend. So he was devastated. I just felt that my, my heart fell in the floor. I literally felt and, and hurt my, uh, my heart fell in the floor because I knew there was no hope. And I tried to open up my eyes to wake up and it was still the same nightmare that my sister was not gonna be coming home no more. And um, it was that moment I will never forget. With no murder weapon and little evidence recovered from the scene, police were desperately looking for leads. Suspicion turned to Laura Hobbs's father, Jerry, who'd been the one to find the girls that morning. They wouldn't say, right? Because uh, they didn't know who it was. Then later on, I found out that they were accusing Laura's father. Laura's dad has done some crazy things in Texas that he was chasing people with chainsaws. He was very destructive. And uh, he's been in jail multiple times for drug abuse and for just being very violent. The police jumped to conclusions. Perhaps understandably, but nevertheless do, that Jerry Hobbs is in fact the killer of these two girls. And they interrogate him intensively for 24 hours in that May of 2005. And in the end, Jerry Hobbs confesses. Well, it was hard to think that somebody could do that for his own daughter and somebody else's daughter. 
It just didn't make sense though, that why would a father do that? And I was thinking, well, there was money missing. You think he was just got so angry that he'd take it out on the girls like this? None of it made sense. The police believe they had their killer and Jerry Hobbs remained in custody awaiting trial. Following the tragic loss of Crystal and Laura, the family and community in Zion were left devastated. A few days later, after that situation, we found flowers in our flower bed that my mom didn't plant. I know it had to be my sister, and she did it for Mother's Day. And that's when things became more real. That's when I realized that she's really gone. and. Um, you know, she, my little sister was just trying to do something special for my mom for Mother's Day. And, you know, and days later we see it. We obviously didn't notice it at the moment, at the time, because we're just, we were devastated. And then my mom's like, where do these flowers come from? And all I could think was her planting them with Laura. We were trying to live our lives, but there's always somebody that is missing in our household. Yes, uh, we miss her a lot. The Tobias family tried to come to terms with their loss. Alberto, needing his friends during this difficult time, remained in touch with Jorge Torres. But shortly after the murders, Torres enlisted in the Marines. He had an interest in becoming a Marine from early life. So as soon as he was out of high school, he went right into the Marines. He had a whole series of solid relationships. You can't be a loner in the military. So I think there's a sense in which Torres realizes that he does want to actually make connections with other people. And this is a circumstance he'll be able to do that in. As a US Marine, Torres was stationed at various locations around the world, but he would always make time to stay in touch with Alberto. He would call me and let me know that he's coming back home for, for a week or so, and we would go hang out. In April 2009, Torres, now 20, was assigned an administrative role, and he moved into naval barracks in Arlington, Virginia. Arlington County is often referred to as an urban village. It's just across the river from Washington, D.C. It's a wonderful community to live and to work and to raise a family. In February 2010, the Arlington community was shaken when, during some of its worst winter storms on record, a series of violent attacks against women occurred. The, the D.C. area is not known for uh, extreme weather. But that particular season, we got one of the biggest snowstorms in history. And uh, it's the entire region was locked down. The adverse weather conditions affected public transport, forcing many of the city's residents to travel on foot. On February the 10th, a female nurse was walking to her boyfriend's house after a shift at the local hospital. It was after midnight. The streets were, were deserted. No one was around, really. She gets approached from behind by a man, taps her on the shoulder, and says, uh, stop right there. I have a gun. He took it out, and he pressed it to her side and told her to keep walking. She knows that she's about a half a block away. And he says, get in the car. Get in my car and he started guiding her at gunpoint towards his car, and she just decided that that was not gonna happen. And she tosses her purse, and he's distracted for a minute, and she runs, she bangs on the door, screaming, let me in, let me in. And I remember her telling us that if he's gonna shoot me in the back, he's gonna shoot me in the back, but I'm, I I'm not getting in the car. The streets in Arlington, Virginia are considered to be safe. So when this woman called up the PD, Arlington PD, and said, I, I have just been uh, accosted, uh, and a, a, a guy tried to abduct me, he had a gun, and I ran off, 
they took note. They responded immediately. She was able to describe for the sketch artist that he was a Hispanic male, about 5'7", maybe 150. She also was able to provide information about the vehicle that he was trying to get her to get into. She remembered that it was a either silver or gray Dodge Durango, which is a type of SUV. With no license plate and nothing else to go on, the investigation was slow to start. But the attacker was quick to move on to his next victim. Two weeks later, on the evening of the 26th of February, a young woman was approached as she walked home alone. A man comes up behind her and says, you come with me, get in my car. And she's shocked, she's surprised, she's scared out of her mind. And she turns around and she resists. She says, no, I'm not gonna do that. And he tases her, attempts to disable her, knock her down, abduct her. The taser doesn't really do its job. She was able to move quickly, and um, he never was able to actually have an encounter with her. But she did report the incident to police. She reported a particular description. And now law enforcement was beginning to put together these two separate incidents. The predator had failed twice in his attempts to attack and abduct local women. But he was determined that his next victim wouldn't have a chance to escape. The armed attacker struck for a third time, ambushing two friends as they walked home from a night out. They were walking up the front walk. They got to the front door, and virtually out of nowhere, this individual appeared. He held a gun to both of them. They were opening the door. He forced them into their own home. He made them sit on, on a sofa in, in the small living room. Of course, they were terrorized. They were paralyzed with fear. He says, is anybody else in the house? And they say no, even though they know there's a roommate upstairs. Um, they don't want to involve her. He then asked both girls to move into a first floor bedroom and push them into the room and force them at gunpoint. He then grabbed uh, several um, appliances in the house. One was a vacuum cleaner and then also an iron. And he used those cords to bind the women doesn't do a very good job. And one of the young women uh, is able to grab a, a, a cell phone out of her pocket because he hasn't patted her down. And she attempts to call 911, at which time he comes back in the room, sees her on the phone, takes the phone, smashes it against a wall, and now he's furious. It's unplanned. He's acting spontaneously. He is so determined that he's going to attack somebody on this evening that when he actually comes to do it, he's not quite sure of how to carry it through. With no apparent plan, the perpetrator dragged one of the women to his car before driving off. The other young woman who was now gathering herself because now her friend, her roommate, has just been taken from the home. She has no idea where she's gone. She runs out the front door doesn't see her friend, doesn't see the assailant, doesn't see any cars moving, uh, you know, runs back in, calls 911. This is not a violent, prone community. So the abduction of a young woman is all hands on deck. The all points bulletin goes, goes out across, not just Arlington, but across Northern Virginia. The crime scene detectives and unit comes to the house, they're dusting for prints, they're taking photographs of the area, they're looking for clues outside the home. And as that's happening, and she's being interviewed and she's, you know, being um, tended to because she was quite traumatized, um, now our other victim is in a car with this individual. The woman was subjected to several hours of torture by her attacker, who, after two thwarted abduction attempts, had finally succeeded in his plan burning rage and that resentment and how dare these victims get away from me. So the next victim, he's determined that he's gonna carry this through. And he pulled over and he got in the back seat and he raped her. He sodomized her, rapes her, and then he takes off driving. And of course, the whole time he has a firearm that he threatens her with so that she would be compliant. 
she is dazed and disgusted and vomiting, and, and she realizes that they're driving for a long way. This isn't just around the corner. They're on a highway. She sees signs. She knows that she's going miles and miles away from Arlington, Virginia. He drives to a very secluded area, sort of like a forest preserve, an off-road area completely covered in snow, um, about 100 yards or so from the, the roadway. From there, he gets out of the car. He gets the victim out of the car, and um, he rapes her again. There's no question about the fact that after raping this young woman, after abducting her, binding her, raping her, that he intended to kill her. And then he takes the scarf that she was wearing, and he begins to tighten the scarf around her neck, and she asks him, you know, in a very plaintive voice, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? And he said, what do you think I'm doing? He pulled it as tight as he could, cut off her breathing, and for what he imagined, what he thought, that he was successful and that he had killed the woman, and she was dead. But he hadn't. Unbelievably, the woman survived the attack. She regains consciousness. She realizes that she is freezing. She's lying half naked in the snow, but she has a will to live and she looks up and she can see that there's a road not far away. She sees cars on the road. And so she crawls on her arms and legs toward the road and she starts screaming. Shocked by the woman's condition, a passing car stopped to help and called an ambulance. She had quite a lot of trauma to her feet and her extremities um, because she was so close to being uh, uh, strangled to death. Uh, the, the petechial hemorrhaging, her, the whites of her eyes were completely made red. It was something to see even days later when we first met her. It was still something that I'd never seen in my career. We learned later from talking to the medical experts that she was within seconds of actually um, being killed. Officers were able to glean detailed information about the perpetrator's appearance from his victim, and crucially, about the car that was used in the attack. It was remarkable just how composed this young woman was given what she had just been through. As traumatic as the situation was, um, she had the constitution to be quite lucid. You know, she had a, a great recollection of what he looked like, the words he said, the car. A significant break in the search for the perpetrator came from a patrol officer who was just about to finish his shift when he heard something familiar on the radio. He remembered that several days previously, while he was on his patrol, he had watched this car, um, and it was a Dodge Durango, and it appeared just to sort of be hunting through the streets of Arlington. He wasn't breaking any laws, he wasn't violating any traffic uh, laws or anything, but there was just something that caught his attention. So odd was the behavior that the officer had written down the vehicle registration and, on hearing about the abduction, had rushed to pinpoint its owner. They then confirmed that it came back to this individual who, as it happened, uh, was a member of the United States military and was stationed at Fort Myer. Through that presence of mind and the ability to do just ordinary but really good police work, um, we were able to run the tag, um, and the tag came back to Jorge Torres. The name meant little to them at the time, but it would later become one they'd never forget. Armed with a photo, Detectives showed the victim, who was still receiving treatment in hospital, for her injuries. And she identifies him. And she says, yes, yes, that's the man that attacked me. Torres had no idea that he'd failed once again, and that the woman he'd attacked had survived, and had his face etched in her brain. 
Naval Criminal Investigation Services were drafted in and a team dispatched to the barracks on the 27th of February, 2010. They slowly drive through the garage and they find the vehicle with a license plate and they park there and they wait. I remember one of the officers looking into the window of the car and he was yelling out to his colleagues, what was the description of the iron that the victim described? What did she say it was? And they shouted back at him, it was a white sunbeam iron. And he goes, yep, I'm looking at a white sunbeam iron back here. At a certain point, a young Marine comes down, looking smart, dressed in jeans, gets into the car, tries to get in the car, and they arrest Jorge Torres right there. Torres was taken into custody and questioned. And what we did learn after his arrest was that this incident that he was involved in in Arlington, these two uh, incidents, uh, was just the tip of the iceberg. Samples of DNA were about to reveal dark secrets from Torres's past that would shock everyone. Upon arrest for a series of various charges, um, a, a sample of a suspect's DNA is entered into the nationwide DNA data bank. That happened after Torres was arrested, and as a consequence, there was what's called a cold hit. And the hit was a hit in two places. One cold hit linked the DNA taken from Torres to the unsolved murder of Navy corpsman Amanda Snell, who lived in the same barracks as Torres and had been found dead in her room on the 13th of July, 2009. She had pretensions of being a naval officer, and she was a lovely, lovely young woman. One day, she did not show up for work, and her co-workers reported that. And so, in a normal course of checking out what was going on with Amanda, they went to her barracks. They look inside the closet and they see Amanda Snell slumped over with a pillowcase over her head. At that point, they call in the police. At the time, investigators were baffled. In investigating the death, of Amanda Snell, uh, didn't see any visible signs of struggle. The investigators were flummoxed. They didn't really know what had happened or what the cause of death was. NCIS went and interviewed people on her hall. And one of the people that they spoke to and interviewed was a Marine named Jorge Torres. And Torres was very helpful. He, he said he knew her, but he didn't know her well. The new DNA evidence contradicted this story, and he became lead suspect for the murder of Amanda Snell. The second DNA match was from a sample taken from the bodies of Crystal Tobias and Laura Hobbs in Illinois back in 2005. They knew at the time that there was foreign DNA on one of the girls. They didn't know who it was. It turned out that that was Torres's DNA. While in jail, Torres would confirm police suspicions when an informant wearing a wire recorded a shocking confession. Torres admitted to this inmate who was recording that he had indeed been responsible for the murders of the two young girls in Zion, Illinois, and he admitted to the murder of Amanda Snell. He's boasting about it. This tells us a lot about Torres's personality and his psychology. It's not enough for him to be violent and deadly. He wants to be seen to be violent and deadly. The news that Torres was in prison had already reached Alberto Seguera when out of the blue, he received a call from his friend. Hey, what's up, George? How you doing, buddy? Dude, not so well. I'm like, man, yeah, I know your sister was telling me you got into some trouble, dude. I hope it ain't nothing crazy. What, what you try to do, send some guns back? You know, from, from where you're stationed? He was like, no, nah, man. 
It's like, so I'm gonna just go straight to the point. I'm like, what's up? They're trying to say that I abducted a girl and I killed this girl in the barracks room. And I'm like, whoa, dude, this, what? I'm like, well, you didn't do it, did you? No, of course I didn't do it. I was like, well, you got this, dude. I believe in you. He was like, well, there's more to it. Well, because of these murders, they're trying to link me back to when your sister died. And I'm like, whoa. I was like, well, you didn't do it, right? And there was a pause. And I'm like, huh. I was lost for words because by him pausing just for a little bit made me realize that this, he probably was the guy. And I, I, I was trying to stay positive the whole time. And I'm like, well, bro, you say you didn't do it, right? No, I didn't do it, dude. I, I, I swear to you. And that was the last time that I would talk to George. Not even in my wildest dream would think that, that uh, George uh, Torres would be the one who did that to us, no. This was somebody that was coming back and hanging out with me after my sister was dead. And he was the one to do it. With Torres now the proven killer, in August 2010, Laura Hobbs's father, Jerry, was finally released from prison after serving five years for the murder of the two schoolgirls, a crime he didn't commit. He has claimed his innocence all along. He has said, I was forced to make that confession. I would never kill my daughter. It's absurd. I am wrongfully accused. I am wrongfully jailed. So when the truth comes out that it's Torres, he is totally vindicated. Hobbs would later go on to successfully sue Lake County. I felt real bad for Jerry Hobbs because he obviously went to prison and was accused of killing his daughter. And for five years, people were blaming Jerry Hobbs for killing both girls when it really wasn't him. On the 12th of October, 2010, the first trial began in Arlington, where prosecutors brought 17 charges against Torres, including abduction, use of firearms, and rape. Torres pleaded not guilty. He didn't confess. So it forced the women who he had tried to abduct and the woman who he abducted and raped and tried to kill to relive those horrific events. We did have overwhelming evidence of guilt. We had the identity, we had him in the car, we had the victim's ID in the back of the car, we had her earring, her DNA on, in his car. So this was no longer a who done it. it was maybe a why he did it. Torres was found guilty on 14 charges and the 22-year-old was sentenced to five life terms plus 168 years in prison. The victims were tremendously gratified. There was a lot of hugging and crying and um, a sense of relief. In March 2014, Torres was back in court for the murder of Amanda Snell. He was found guilty and given the death penalty. It would be another four years in 2018 before Alberto and his family would finally see justice served for Crystal and Laura. It was an emotional trial. The judge was showing to the courtroom and everybody else that how the bodies of the girls that happened on Mother's Day, how they were laid out. And I happened just to peek and see it and I fainted for just a for a second where I had to catch my catch myself from falling. Marina and Alberto both testified against Torres. It was uh, intimidating, but actually, when I saw him and he looked at me, I I really thought that uh, that. Uh, 
that, that he actually did it. That um, just by seeing him, he was just like no remorse, no, no nothing, no feeling. I had him right there in front. I could have hit him. I could have done so much to him, but what good would I have done? When I walked down to George after getting off the stand, I walked up to him and I made eye contact the whole way there. Um, he was barely looking at me. He was looking at me off the corner of his eye and um, maybe he was expecting me to do something dumb. And I walked up to him and I said, hey man, I forgive you, George. I went to the back and I did cry. I cried because I thought about what pain my sister went through and because of this guy. In September 2018, 13 years after he'd brutally killed nine-year-old Crystal Tobias and eight-year-old Laura Hobbs, Jorge Avila Torres was found guilty of their murders. You have to step back and say, he almost got away with two murders. He came this close to getting away with murder, literally, of two young girls. Although already on death row, Torres had an additional 100 years added to his sentence. Jorge Torres was a US Marine. He's the best of the best. And uh, nobody knew that hiding inside this Marine was a true predator, was a true killer. And he was capable of, of horrendous acts of violence. He put us through a lot, so now that he's in jail and waiting for a death sentence, it, it, uh, it's, at least we found out that it, there's justice. Um, although that's not gonna bring my daughter back. I miss my daughter. I, I loved her so much. He took a, a, a piece of our family puzzle that can no longer be here. I love to see my sister have her wedding and graduate high school. He took away memories that um, that we won't be able to witness. He did take a piece of, of our hearts and a big chunk of, of, of our life away for our whole family. Jorge Torres was a prolific predator capable of carrying out heinous and horrific acts against some of the most innocent in our society. His insatiable desire to hunt out his next victims had ultimately led to his demise. He will be forever remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.